Outrageous and a criminal act. I strongly condemn it, and that will increase tension in the occupied territories, will increase confrontation. And we also emphasize the negative. For example, uh, one of the reasons that people make that comment is they say there are so many divorces. One out of three marriages ends in divorce. Well, that's not an accurate figure, and even if it were, two out of three don't. So why are we always looking at the bad side? Most marriages survive. I think a person makes a big mistake to try to with any effect in a novel. If you do, you get the effect and not the novel. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling stories. I'm telling stories that are strongly based in history and that are uh, to a great extent factual, not entirely so, but to a great extent, and um, telling them as well as I know how and as entertaining as I know how. Hello, I'm Bob Pyle, and this is Five Country Close-Up. Tonight we'll be looking at the state of the American family and its future. We'll also spend some time with one of this country's most well-read novelists. But first, one of the major rounds of violence took place in Israeli's West Bank this past month when three West Bank mayors were targets of three carefully placed terrorist bombs. News 5's Debbie Cutter was on vacation in Israel when the bombings took place, and she has this special reaction report. It was Monday, June 2nd on Israel's West Bank. Before the day was over, seven Arabs and two West Bank mayors would be injured too seriously in terrorist bombings. In Ramallah, Mayor Karim Khalif got into his car to go to work, pressed the accelerator and had his left foot blown off and his right leg mangled. In Nablus, Mayor Shaka lost both his legs above the knees when a carefully placed bomb exploded in his car. In Hebron, seven Arabs were injured when a grenade explodes in a marketplace. The bombings have brought about a new round of tension in the occupied territories, already hot with anti-Israeli feeling. Prime Minister Begin reacted to the bombings with outrage, calling them horrible crimes of the gravest type. Two politically moderate Arab mayors, Mayor Elias Frej of Bethlehem and Mayor Rashad of Gaza, both resigned their posts to protest the bombings, but later withdrew their resignations upon the urging of Arab colleagues. Mayor Frej of Bethlehem reacted this way to the tragedy of a friend and fellow mayor. They are outrageous and a criminal act. I strongly condemn it. And that will increase tension in the occupied territories, will increase confrontation, and it has led almost to the paralysis of my colleagues in Nablus and Ramallah. I repeat that I strongly condemn it. But extreme factions of Israel were happy about the terrorist bombings. That feeling was voiced by the spokesman for the Jewish Defense League, Yossi Dayan, who at one time was accused of knowing who was responsible for the terrorist attacks. I think that this is God's finger, and uh, I'm happy. I think that this is the first time in 13 years that the Jewish can feel joy, because uh, it shows that the wheel can move in the wrong direction, in the other direction. But how do many Israelis feel about this most recent round of violence in their country? It's not only a matter of feeling. It's a matter if people are playing around with explosives, as those people were playing around with explosives for many years by now, it so happened that it hurt them now for a change. It's not a good act at all, I think, because uh, uh, it's, it's bad for the, for the Arabs and for the Israelis too, because uh, uh, what, about, what about the other countries, the European countries, what will they think about this? I mean, uh, they'll get a bad idea about the Israelis also. I'm not sad about it, but I think that in this situation that Israel is now, it was not the best uh, and the wise and the cleverest deed to do, because it's very, it causes very damage, many damages to Israel. So you think it hurts Israel more than helps it? Of course. Most Israelis are upset and angry with the bombing attacks. They are not so much concerned with world opinion towards Israel in this matter as with the fact this type of violence is immoral. They are upset because they believe this type of revenge retaliation is wrong. Officials say one of the most disturbing aspects of the bombings was that they were the work of experts, well planned and coordinated by a team of terrorists. And it is now feared it may be the beginning of a new strain of terrorist confrontation between the Israelis and Palestinians. The bombings also come at a time of new turmoil in the Begin cabinet. Two weeks ago, Defense Minister Ezer Wiseman resigned over Begin's hardline policies, but it now appears the Begin government has weathered the storm. 
When asked whether world powers such as the United States should stay out of Israel's affairs in the Middle East, Mayor Frege of Bethlehem had this to say. On the contrary, the United States lost its credibility because of its weakness and its weak policy in the Middle East. I appeal to the American people, to the President of the United States, to have an even-handed policy in the Middle East and to help the Palestinian Arabs achieve their right for self-determination and to help us to live in peace and to protect us if possible. Most political leaders in Israel say they want a strong America. They believe a strong United States can help keep peace in the Middle East. Up to now, the Camp David Accords have called for that peace, but extreme factions among the Israelis and the Palestinians are trying to torpedo that process. Deborah Cutter for News 5 in Jerusalem. On a related note to Debbie's story, President Carter welcomed Jordan's King Hussein to the White House this morning. Carter hopes to sway King Hussein into joining the Mideast peace talks. But Hussein says he won't change his mind, and he doubts that he will by the end of the two days of talks, which are aimed at easing an 18-month strain in relations stemming from Hussein's sharp disagreement with the Camp David Accords. Both Carter and Hussein share common goals, but they differ on the ways of achieving them. If nothing else comes from these talks, Carter hopes the meetings will help reopen dialogue with Hussein, which was disrupted by the trauma of Camp David. The American family. For myself, it was a good experience. Dad taught me integrity. Mom gave me a sense of honesty. And as for my brother, well, I learned from his mistakes. Well, some experts say the family's in trouble. So we looked into what the experts fear, and here's our report. Relationship canceled. As a right. The American family. How do we perceive it? Let your family meet our family. This, this is something special. All the sorrow. There's plenty of room for hope. All the laughter. <laughs> I like your style. A family just like your own. I mean, we are a big, large, loud, noisy family. Even though these boob tube families are fun to watch, most of us have to agree that their real life situations are not all that real life. I think we also have a tendency to compare our families with the ideal family types that we sometimes see on television, like the Waltons. I don't know any families like the Waltons. I know some that are, are close to it, but most families aren't like that. Most families don't solve problems as well as the Waltons do or encounter crisis and stress and come through it smiling happily as a family. So we say, well, I'm, family life is deteriorating because uh, we're not as in good a shape as the Waltons or, or the family down the street. But if you really knew the family down the street, you might not be saying that. A recent Gallup poll asked those families down the street just what they thought the state of the American family is in. The results showed that more than 50% think the family of today is in a decaying state. I don't think it is because I think we have a tendency to see sometimes what we want to see. And we also emphasize the negative. For example, uh, one of the reasons that people make that comment is they say there are so many divorces. One out of three marriages ends in divorce. Well, that's not an accurate figure. And even if it were, two out of three don't. So why are we always looking at the bad side? Most marriages survive. One family that has survived, and very well, is the Soleil family of Ames. Loring and his wife Kay and their four children have found a lifestyle that suits them just fine. <laughs> well, it, if, if it is laid back, part of that is a, uh, I don't know, some sort of a creation of both of us. Uh, at times it's extraordinarily hectic that we have, anytime you get six people together and you get, as Kay's already talked about this, people going different directions at the same time, um, whether it's uh, Scott's being in some sort of dramatic production, uh, Christy working on the newspaper, whatever it happens to be, Karen playing in the band, there, there are times which we feel very much stretched in a number of different directions. And that, I guess, does not seem laid back. There are times where we very consciously try to when we do have everybody here and we do have the opportunity to relax and to uh, not push as much as we can. Well, I think it's difficult to pinpoint something in a situation that you live in every day, but basically I think it's strong because most of the time we have a real sense of satisfaction about ourselves as a unit, about the way we work together, the way we feel about each other. Um, just a, a general contentment, which doesn't mean that we never have disagreements or that th bad things don't happen, but 
we seem to be able to work them out and, and we talk to each other about the things that happen. Loring and Kay feel lucky that their family hasn't been plagued with the problems that many other families have been. Drugs, delinquency, runaways, as well as financial problems. The Soleils have been free of all that, and the big reason they feel is that they communicate. Well, it seems to me without it, you don't really have a family. I think if there's one ingredient that has to be there, it's talking to each other about everything. Well, it's, that, that, it's the key. It's the absolute essential. The one thing that I think that locks the, or the, the, the sets the dynamics in our family is that ability to talk about anything, absolutely anything. And that open dialogue, I think, is what, one of the things that cements us together. Communication comes in many ways at the Soleil House. Either it's on the front lawn watching a friendly basketball game or practicing a little eye-hand coordination with the flying frisbee or at the nightly meeting place, the family dinner table. How was work? Well, it was fine. We laid out a bunch of cheese and everything for people to eat. We don't see the children somehow as being extensions of ourselves. I really do think that, that we look on each child as being very much individual, as individual as, our, as one of our best friends would be. And I think we have a real, Loring and I have a great deal of respect for one another, and that carries to the children. I really think we respect each one of the kids as individuals, as exactly who they are. I don't think we try to make them like each other or like ourselves, but just try to be the best of who they are. I think our family is close because we're able to talk things out. And, and I feel that's important in a family because being close and being able to talk is where you can express how you feel about, it, about something. They kind of come down to my level, and I feel like they're like my friends and not my parents, really. They're people that, you know, I can open up to, and they're down on my level with me and not up above me, and I'm talking up to them. But as we all know, not all families are as lucky as the Soleils. Many families are running into crisis situations, and the result many times is divorce. There are probably several factors involved in the breakup of marriage and unhappiness in families, uh, dissatisfaction with the lifestyle and, and where they're going and what they want to do. Money can be a problem if there isn't enough money to go around. Families spend money to meet their needs and to also meet some of their wants. And if there isn't enough me money to meet the basic needs, it can put a lot of tension on a family. Families uh, have other kinds of resources to help them. Other family members and friends uh, and clergy are probably the most commonly sought resources when a family is facing crisis. What is it that, that makes for loving companionness? I've uh, been a campus minister now 16 years. And the kinds of changes that I've seen are that I really think people are better prepared for marriage today than they were 16 years ago, uh, especially when it comes to roles. What, did it, what does it mean to be a, a man in a marriage relationship? What does it mean to be a woman? I think uh, young people have a better understanding of, of, of husbandness and wifeness and are much more willing to have uh, what we call egalitarian kinds of relationships. In Gallup's poll, it showed one of the reasons people feel the family is on the downslide is because of a decline in religious values. I do agree that the church is a less prominent influence in a community. Uh, it no longer functions as the social center of a community in larger cities. I think in, in many rural towns, the church uh, still is the, is the social center. But on the other side of the coin, Reverend Putman says the traditional church in some ways divides the family. The one feature I think that, that does detract from family life is a great many of the activities in the church are generational. That is to say, we tend to get adults together, we tend to get children together, and we separate families for a lot of our activities other than worship. By and large, um, a lot of the programming of the church divides families rather than unites them. Many of us think back as we look at our families today and sort of romanticize a previous time. Uh, many, such as myself, grew up on a farm and evenings were spent watching the sun go down and uh, gathering around the, the radio and that sort of thing. And it's just very different today, so we may have to deal with some uh, sense of disappointment or uh, change some of our expectations of what a family really could be. As for changing our expectations as to what the family should be, it's not an easy task. And according to most of the people we talked with for this report, 
They say before you can do that, you have to realize the importance of the family. I think it will always be. It, it's responsibility shift a little bit. There's a movement today to, I think, strengthen the family. And in a sense, we're rediscovering the family, but the family has always been here. And several years ago in the late 60s, individuals were predicting the uh, demise of the family, the death of the family, have long been forgotten, but the family is still here. While talking with the Soleil family, we asked Loring, Kay, and the kids what they had to offer others whose families might be in need of some help. They said the most important thing is to keep the lines of communication open. If something is on your mind, let it out, because according to them, more times than not, it'll help. Coming up, a Old West Revisited with author Louis L'Amour. Stay with us. Last February, Twyla Young and myself. 